Ready? Okay, just before we begin, has anybody read this work? <laughs> have you read this work before? Yes. You have? Okay, you're familiar with it. I actually looked up a YouTube video today. I typed in Grimes, Providence, and Fate, and you gave a talk uh, through a dream exploration, actually. I think it's number 35, in fact. And I could tell that you had read it because you gave the very definitions that he gives of fate in there, in the talk. So, uh, none of the rest of you have read this? We have. You've read it? Mm -hmm. Oh, you have? Yep. Okay, what do you guys remember from it? Because I wouldn't want to talk about some, something you already know, you know? Oh, just for that. I like it when you talk about something I know. Because? Because then I can get to know it better. <laughs> okay. Uh, well, great. I would suggest we just like read a paragraph and jump right in. Um, it's kind of a great work overall because I don't, you guys know that Proclus, sitting on a thousand years of uh, platonic academic work, is like kind of like the culminator of all of the stuff he studied. In it, he refers to Iamblichus, Plotinus, Porphyry. He refers to the oracles. He refers to the gods themselves. And so he's pretty much like an encyclopedia of Platonic thought. And what we see here, I think, is his um, demonstration of the mastery of it, in fact. Because he seems to be able to pull whatever he wants from any section of this entire encyclopedia at any moment. And I think we'll have some fun with it. So let's just read the first paragraph. I, I have a first question uh -huh. for you. Was there something? In this dialogue? Uh, well, I would think in one sense, after you have the structure of what he's trying to present down, then we could have a lot of fun with it. Because obviously, we talk about providence here on Friday nights, and we talk about fate. Tonight, we saw that people had a certain conclusion already in their mind about what somebody's state of mind meant to them. You know, Drake felt like he couldn't, couldn't ask, he couldn't speak. Well, that was a conclusion, and so therefore he played out the fate of that, which is to watch his test go away, and played out the fate in the class of not speaking up and being left unsatisfied. Well, so we have kind of language about that. I think that if we could work with Proclus, we could like expand our kind of ability to talk about it and also use that in our experience. So does that suffice for you? Do you want me to bring you to a... <laughs> oh, he'll develop it. Okay. Yeah, he'll develop we'll it. it. Yeah, it's the first, the beginning of it is pretty basic. Let's do it. All right. Who wants to read? So who's talking in the beginning? I am of opinion that I'm giving. Oh, so we don't have the actual work. Theodorus, this guy, he's a, a mechanist. That's what they, he calls him in, in the work, has somehow written a letter to Proclus and asked him these questions, or made these statements about what is providence and what is fate. I don't know exactly what was said, we don't have the letter, but Proclus is replying to him. So this is Proclus writing back to Theodorus. Oh, Theodorus wrote the letter. The initial one, yeah. So this is his response. Yes, this is Proclus's response. Oh, okay, cool. Yeah. Well, so, okay. So I'll read. All right. I know, right? <laughs> I am of opinion, my friend, Theodorus, that the conceptions of your mind are mature and adapted to a man who loves the contemplation of beings. Beings. Oh. Beings. And I am gratified that you have thought fit to write to us on these subjects. Though there are many among you that are able to investigate and doubt with you about such like problems. But it is requisite, as it seems, that we also should adduce what appears to us to be the truth on the subjects which you have proposed for our discussion, and what we conceive to accord with things themselves. And what we conceive to accord with things themselves and with the opinions of the most celebrated of the philosophers prior to us. 
and that we should not in vain hear the inquiries of a man eminently skilled in mecha mechanics, who was formerly known to us, as I conceive, and as you have and as a, and you and as you have asserted. You inquire, however, about things which have been a thousand times investigated, and which, in my opinion, will never have any rest. Because the soul is excited to the discussion of them, much like having been already thrown on them by the elaborate writings of Plotinus and Iamblichus, and prior to these by the divine Plato, and if it be not too much to say, such particulars respecting them have been proclaimed by the divinely inspired mouth of theologists, as Plato alone has unfolded <coughs> by demonstration. And why is it requisite to adduce to you Plato and men who were divinely wise, since they have been most luminously developed by the gods themselves? who transcendently know what pertains to themselves and what they have produced, and not have been delivered by them in enigmas, as by theologists. It is requisite, therefore, that we also, writing it is requisite, therefore, that we also, writing comfortably to them, should, as I have said, adduce to you what appears to us to be the truth respecting the subjects of your inquiry. All right, thank you. So, pretty nice guy, right? Like, sees his concerns. He, see, he sees that this was, in fact, a friend of theirs, and he wants to give him his full attention and, and return to, to what he's going to give. Now, imagine that somebody came to you and said, like, uh, do we, have, do we have any power of our own? Are we just fated to play out this world that is given to us? Like, we're born into this world. We have already kind of an interpretive system. We form pathologos beliefs as we come through this. Later in life, when things are similar to our pathologos scenes, we play out the same consequences before. And so, if we were to be asked, like, could you have freedom from this fate? Or do we have any freedom? Well, this is what Theodorus is kind of uh, writing to Proclus. And Proclus is now going to put into words uh, what Theodorus' view is of fate and providence. Right. Yeah, that Plato guy. Thousand times. Thousand times. <laughs> All right, will you please read the next paragraph? She's not there. No, you. You. <laughs> you deserve. Can people hear? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Speak out. Yeah. Oh, If looking to the all, uh, <clears throat> you deserve indulgence if looking to the all various tragic and comic and other connections of human affairs. You have conceived that there is only one fabricator and maker of such. Uh, uh, it's written over. I can't read it. Col colligations. Uh, colligations. All right. Combined together is that it? Um, and maker of such colligations in the universe and have called this okay, let me read that again you deserve indul indulgence <laughs> in looking to the all various tragic and comic and, and other connections of human affairs you have conceived that there is only one fabricator and maker of such colligations in the universe and have called this fate or rather you have denominated it the series and consequent generation of have thought that such a dramatic scene alone, directed by some inevitable necessity, and 
I have celebrated this as providence and asserted that it alone possesses freedom of will and is the Lord of all things. But you have conceived that the freedom of will of the human soul is only a name and is truly nothing, since she has an arrangement in the world is subservient to the energies of other things and is a part of the mundane fabric, fabric. Or rather, that I may use your own words, the human soul is a machine since there is an irrefragable cause which moves all things that the world comprehends in itself. But the universe being, as it were, one machine, the whole spheres are complicated in each other, analogously to certain drugs. But the partial animals and souls that are moved by them, and in short, all things depend on one mover. And perhaps in consequence of honoring your art, you have conceived that the maker of the universe is a certain mechanic, mechanic and that you are an imitator of the best of causes. These things, however, we have written mingling the jocose with the serious. Oh, I see. The humor with the serious. Okay. So, do you guys have a problem? No. Huh? Do you have what is Theodorus's view of the universe? Yeah. yeah. Providence alone possesses uh, freedom of will. It's a mechanism. Okay, and what does that mean, according? Um, he's wondering if um, uh, well, what would come down to us today, uh, these days, we would call them um, uh, like like Jean Paul Sartre or something, you know. There, there's there's no meaning in the universe. There's no intelligibility. There's ultimately no self, no mind, no self, no rationality. It's just the whole thing is just a ticking clock. Right. Set in motion by some great creator. And in fact, if we think we have free will or if we think we have choice, it's really just an image. It's just something we imagine, right? And the only thing. But he does say something has free will. Providence. Yes, providence. Yeah. Which is what? Fabricator. Oh. Fabricator, right? Like, yeah. And so a fabricator then brings into a maker. The maker sets up the big machine according to rules. Once all the rules are in place, he kicks it into motion and then goes off and has a vacation on his own. Because <laughs> the whole world... So it's an uncaring mechanical universe. One that's just run in one sense, in the way that it sounds like, almost like, by science and physical laws. And if that were the case, what would be the place for providence? Right. Well, other than the fact that it, it has like a semi like vague Platonism in there, which it says the one infragable cause. So it makes it sound like, because the one is the one which encompasses all the holes, it's already determine everything that follows from that. It's got an air of like reason in it, for sure. How would you respond to such a person? <laughs> like I run this philosophy club on campus and these kids show up all the time. They present their views of me and I'm like, uh, <laughs> what am I supposed to do? <laughs> So apparently this is also a friend. It says earlier that, you know, that he was known to them. Early. And so Proclus wants to take some time and help him out of this problem. And so we're actually going to see like, how he would educate Theodorus and how he, would, uh, how he would help him come to understand these terms. Because Theodorus at this point has no way of getting out of this. He doesn't even have the vocabulary. He's like deficient. And so... Proclus the Generous, I mean, he's going to come forth and give all these models to help Theodorus understand his, even his own question. Like, he's like going to supplement Theodorus' lack of understanding his own point. So in this case, we can see him like really 
pulling forward like what Socrates does, but of course he's not going to like do it through question and answer. He's just going to present it to him. So, anybody got an idea of how you'd help this poor soul? Yeah. I know what Pierre did with me once, mm. but it, I, I don't think it... The problem is, the reason it worked with me, uh, it wouldn't necessarily work with every single person, but I remember we were having a savvy discussion once, and, and Pierre just said, um, mm -hmm. he tried to bring it back to me, and he said, anything in your life that's been unexplainable? I could think of a few things. And then he also added, what about Socrates? How about Socrates? How, how, how about the way he acts? And some of the pretty amazing things in some of those dialogues. And I went, yeah. And so he said, so for all of these things, what word would you put on it? Mm -hmm. And what did you say? I had to think about it a little bit, but I answered uh, divinity. Divinity. And because? Well, it's the best word I can put at the time for it. <laughs> But, well, what does it explain? But to, but to use any word like divinity, that or any other in that, in that class, mm -hmm. you've already stepped over the line from mechanism. Uh -huh. So, I'm just, I throw that out as something that Pierre did with me, but I can't. So, and notice, he got you actually into a state of mind. Yes. Regina has said, I'd want to know his state of mind. We don't take any of this approach. Like, reading Proclus, if you've read this, you'd be like, how is this Platonism? Mm -hmm. It's very weird. Like, I read it and I was like, I don't, if you read ahead, you'll find that he starts to talk about the intelligible and the sensible and the breakdown of the world of becoming as a part of the sensible and the world of being as a part of the intelligible. And he breaks down this model and the soul is an intermediary that lives between the two. We don't talk about that as like fate or anything. And that's actually, so he's kind of, giving him the academic approach. Well, yeah, it does. It seems like a very Aristotelian influence. And I, I, you got to help me because I'm not learning. Like, I don't even know, I don't even know what that <laughs> means. <laughs> <laughs> I think I read some, some work of Aristotle. But what do you mean by that? Well, in the sense that he's, he himself is still very much <coughs> influenced by the mechanistic, uh, just as, as, you, as you explained, which is what Aristotle is. So uh -huh. to mix Aristotle, I think, I don't know, I, I think these guys often tried to mix Plato with Aristotle. And uh -huh. that's kind of where a lot of the Neo-Platonism was. But it has exactly this problem. So what I would like to do is two things, actually. One is read through and get the model that he's using. And like see how it's a pretty great model in one sense, but we could actually build on it and, and push it further especially with the work that we've covered through midwifery. Like, it's easy to see how, like, this thing is faded, and it will just fall and stay there, you know? And the pen will stay there. And anything in this physical world will do what it needs to do until it's done what it's done, and then stops moving because it's moved by other things. But how do we actually apply that to our midwifery? Mm -hmm. Like, how do we call our beliefs something that are alter motive? Are they moved by others? Like when we are so, like last week Pierre drew this thing right here. The famous, you know, we enter into a fantasy and here we are and that fantasy has an image of us and then we play out whatever is the consequence of it until at some point who knows what, right, wakes us up and we pop out of it and we think, well, that, that's, that wasn't me. That's not really going on. And we wake up from it. So, once we take on that belief, what would you call what follows? And especially then, if, if we're going to use it, he uses these three terms. There's the self-motive. Mm -hmm. And the alter-motive. And the unmoved, which I'll have to put up here. And so the unmoved are the things of the intellect, the self-moved are the things of the soul, and the alter motive are the things of the body. And he takes about three paragraphs to kind of line this up and explain what they are and how they fit in together. Uh, 
if we don't want to read it <clears throat> because we've seen it and heard it before, then we can just jump into the implications of it, which I think is more entertaining. Yeah. So. So this is. Yeah. Goes along with that self-image. Yes. Okay. So in one sense, if you were to use these terms, what's it like when this part's going on? Seems exciting. Very it's involved. Involved. Are you in control of it? No. Are you the one that's directing and guiding it? No. No. no so in that sense, it's alter motive. It seems to have its own life unto itself, right? I use the word seems. In a way, in a way, that's almost like the ticking clock. Yeah, right. You've just set into motion this rule, and every time we look at a self-image, not only does it have a self-image, but it's got like a little set of beliefs, right? Be, if this, if this image is true, uh, then I'm going to perform X, Y, and Z, and I'm going to feel in these ways. And once we have this image of us, then the implications play themselves out, like the mechanical side of us. Leading to failure. Yeah. Leading to failure or whatever happens to be, mm -hmm. you know. Failure could be if you are going for a goal. It could also be like a, a fight, <laughs> you know. <laughs> Me, I have, tend to have fight images with my kids sometimes that come up. And so it, in one sense, we would call this world, because of the way that we've learned to call it, we call that fate, right? That's right. And then and at the same time, there's a connection to it. All these things come together. Not only do we have actions, right? But whenever we study any scene, what comes along with actions? Uh, states of mind. What else? Feelings, Feelings right? Words. Uh huh. Oh, yeah, words. And words. These are various. There's nothing in the scene that actually says we should feel this way. If we were to be awake and see this image and it were to pop up to us, we'd be like, oh, wait a minute. That's not going to happen. That doesn't need to occur. It wouldn't make any sense at all. In fact, it would appear alien to us. But somehow, when we pop into these similar situations, all of these things come together, connected as one. And then we, we of course, know if we want to follow them, they would go back to our past, and we'd be able to look at them, and they would have that parallel structure. But what allows that to actually happen? What allows this connection to occur? And what I mean by that is I'm looking in two ways. What's the action that makes it occur? And what is it that even allows this thing to keep going on? Because none of us would want to live this way. None of us would say, hey, I, I want to feel trapped. I mean, Drake himself even said tonight, like, I wish he would have stayed. He said he felt trapped. See, um, <clears throat> I think you asked the question, what strategy is he using? Who? And Proclus? I think it's clear in the first four chapters, he gives evidence that he understands Theodora. So uh -huh. he says, your basic thinking is, can be subsumed under the idea of fate. Uh -huh. And then he gives a description of it. Right. Uh -huh. And that description of it is so well developed that you can recognize it as our modern view. Uh -huh. right. But then he says, I want to show you that fate is suspended from providence. Right, right. Therefore, he's not criticizing the fate. No. He's saying you have an incomplete vision. Yeah. Now let me tell you what, what it presupposes. It presupposes providence. Yeah. Because how could, for us, fate, for him, fate has no necessarily intelligence unto itself. That's right. It's just connection. Just, yeah, an yeah. ordered, yeah. ordered, rational system without anything divine. Right. But Which then what an, allows it to actually occur and be connected is providence. It, it, those his, things are connected, because nothing comes together for Proclus every... All union is good. <laughs> the, the good. The good is identical to the one. So according to Proclus, if things are connected, they must have some goodness to them. And fate alone or nature alone couldn't bring that goodness. Yeah, but see, is he not taking fate 
and showing it's incomplete. Yes. So that parallel, all of the points in respect to fate are lined up. Mm -hmm. And then he has this superior view that includes it. Right. Mm -hmm. so yeah, you, yeah. So he's saying, by the way, you've got a great system, it's incomplete. Mm -hmm. Well, it's got no soul. It's yeah, got no it's self in, in it. It's incomplete. Yeah, it's got no self in it. Yeah. It's just a, it's actually like a top and a bottom view, right? It's like, here we have the intellect, which is the fabricator. Mm -hmm. And then here we have the sensible or the body. And there's no mean. Mm -hmm. There's like a gap in between them for Theodorus. There's been nothing in there that's going to connect them. The one is just ruling over the other. So, in terms of now providence coming in and um, encompassing this, we would ask, like right here, what was what's allowed? What's what allowed this to occur? What allowed this connection to happen? Especially if it's all these negative feelings and things, right? But it's complete the Theodorus for what, people who accept the contemporary view, it's complete for them. They don't know it is incomplete. No, they don't, yeah. So he's going to have to say, make room, and I'll show you parallel to the one is the other. Yeah, and yes he is. that's a very interesting way of reasoning. But when you wake up at the end and discover that's not, that is only your self-image, it's not yourself, mm -hmm. is that the providence? Or does Theodorus have that? Does Theodorus have a waking up? A waking up in his model of faith? No. Okay. No, he's had no discussion of it. There's no place for anybody's participation in it other than, as he says, it's an image. It just appears like we have free choice and free will. We don't have intellect to come up with the, what this, any of this means or influence any of it or change any of it. It's a helpless system. It's a helpless system. So, but uh -huh. I wanted to, I'm misunderstanding. Are you saying that providence is something in which Theodorus is holding um, separate? I, um, well, what I'm seeing is that Theodorus, the way he's describing what Theodorus's position is for providence, is not very high at all. Oh no, yeah, right. In fact, it's mechanical and part of a mechani mechan me mechanical view. Uh -huh. So I'm wondering what Pierre's saying is that he has a limited view. He doesn't see, even in providence, that there's something higher. Okay, like? That, at least that's how I was understanding what Pierre was adding. And from what he's saying here, he says um, that such a dramatic scene alone directed by some inevitable necessity and have celebrated this as providence. And he uses the word and asserted that it alone possesses freedom of will and is the Lord of all things. Mm -hmm. But you have conceived that the freedom of will of the human soul is only a name mm -hmm. and is truly nothing since it has an arrangement in the world is subservient to the energies of other things and is a part of the mundane fabric. Yeah, so just he's not caught up like everything that, else. He's not seeing anything noble in providence. No. Except that it may be uh, considered a intellectual name for... I guess the... The, the cause, yeah, the, the cause. cause, yeah, yeah. Which, in fact, later, Proclus helps him to see that that's actually fate. Okay. Yeah, he calls mm. that necessity, mm. he drives that, you know, that there is this thing that drives, even as our human bodies, there's something within us that keeps us ourselves, and there's something that brings things in to keep us healthy. There's, it's in all of us, it's in nature, it is nature itself, it's necessity. He calls all these things the same thing. And so Theodorus is, is misnaming it. He doesn't even see that there is something beyond fate. Even what he calls providence well, he's not is fate. not it based on his idea of what he thinks is the highest. Mm -hmm. 
as I, I mean, he's calling it fate, but it, that's how he's, that's as high as he can go, as, as I understand it's being said. I think for what, what I would offer up is Proclus tries to give him a view of providence. He really does try to define what is providence. No, I'm not saying mm. providence. I mean Theodore, sorry. Oh, yeah. I'm just saying that he's taking what Theodore's is position and Theodorus' position is limited. Yes, definitely. That's all. I, I, if I said Proclus, I'm No, I'm saying, though, no, yeah, now, how does Proclus take him outside of his limit? Like, how does he educate him? This has got to be something pretty hard, like, how do you get somebody to come into a concept of providence? Like, I don't know, when I talk to people about philosophy and what I'm into and dreams, and they ask me, like, what do you mean by providence? It's a hard concept to come up with. Proclus is pretty clear about it. He's such a nerd, though. You know, he just dives right into the word. He says it's pro-video and that it's seeing ahead. But it, or it's seeing... Yeah, seeing ahead is what he calls it. And then he says... Uh, in fact, though, like, think of the word provide. It brings goodness. And then he quotes Plato and says that the only thing that could be the cause of good would be God. And so... In that case, he's trying to actually open him up to the idea of goodness and of goodness coming about as a result of these things and goodness being present, even in the world of fate. Even in the world of fate, there's still some goodness. This is something to me, like, we try to get out of this as much as possible. In fact, we don't want to be in these states. We consider them uh, trapped or closed or uh, unopened or we're limited, right? We're limited in that sense. We can't be, our, we can't be self that participates of the unlimited. So, what I think is interesting is, that even though Proclus is laying all this out for him, no matter what Proclus does, and all of this great intellectual work, which I love because I'm fully into like the Platonic philosophy of it, it still won't free Theodorus. He still won't be able to participate. So, if you were to skip ahead, he talks about what are the different types of uh, knowledge. And he says, the soul can participate of either one of these, right? Mm. So it's in the middle. Mm. It has eternal essence, but its activity occurs in time, is what he says. So it really has a choice. Do I go up or do I go down? And if I go up, I'm going to be like the gods. I'm going to mount up. I'm going to get my wings back. I'm going to fly, circumambulate the world, and live uh, purified before I had lost my feathers. You know, he quotes... Uh, the Phaedo, or Phaedra is pretty well. Or it can go down here and put itself and be subservient. So he says then, it's really up to us. So you have providence, which in one sense is free unto itself. You have the body, which has no choice. And we have us, we can go in between these two. So, then this is where I really, if you were to ask me, Regina, what would be the part that I would think would be most interesting? Is when he starts talking about what is the soul's power. Because he says, a soul that lives by virtue will be free. And I'm kind of confused what he means by that. Like, what does he mean by living by virtue? Or what does he mean by living by virtue of the soul? Then what he lays out after that is five different ways of knowing. And I was like, I was thinking about it, I was like, well, is he saying that the soul's virtue is knowing? And these are the different ways? So, that's kind of where I... Let's read the five ways. Oh, they're wonderful, yeah. I'd say the difficulty he has is that um, he doesn't cite the importance of the Logos. Proclus. Yeah, in this text. Okay. Yes, he doesn't. That's right. Yeah. And so no matter what, all of that is still lacking. So while, while I do love Proclus, and I think if I 
like one of the things that came into this talk was like, I would love to share how awesome he is. But at the same time, it's an incomplete model. Because it doesn't explain, one, whatever the pathologos is, or whatever the participation of, how the participation in intellect is participation in the logos. Like they don't describe this as much as if I had not had an introduction into midwifery, I would not understand Platonic philosophy. That's true. There's, like, I don't know what it means to live in the world of intellect. What is a, what is, you know, a, what is that which is unmoved? <laughs> you know, like, that's what they call this, the unmoved. Uh, that, what is that which always is? Uh, how does it relate to, how does it produce the world of becoming? I, mm -hmm. I don't understand any of that. And even when you tell me model copy and things like that, all that's still very intellectual. It has no contact. So what actually frees us from this is in one sense, um, even if it is a pathologos, it can only come into existence if it's an image of the logos. So one of the things that comes up to me is like when these things occur, what are we supposed to do with them? So don't we have a problem as philosophers? We know we don't know, but we don't know what we don't know. Yeah, he covers that from uh, the apology. Uh huh. And uh, <clears throat> what do you think of that? His understanding of that great section on the apology on here. I don't. I don't remember that part right now at this moment. But oh, he quotes twenty uh, one C in the apology. Mm hmm where he makes the contrast from his friend Shapiron who went to the Delphic Oracle and asked, is there anyone wiser? Mm -hmm. And Socrates says, well, many things, but then he gets to the essence of it. And he says, well, you know, my difference, my particular difference is only a trifle. Mm -hmm. And that is what I do not know, I do not think I do. Right, right. right. So he then, it's Proclus's task to unpack that. Uh -huh. And he gives a very nice description of it. Uh -huh. And I just wanted to... Uh, I don't remember that part especially, but I'd oh, be okay. glad to look at it. Do you remember it? Um, I could get it. Um, Even if we find it in one sense, these things, they show us what we didn't know. If you're able to, I think you can work backwards from a pathologos. I have this really weird idea that even though a pathologos occurs, it only occurred actually because of providence allowed it to occur. So we should be able to see what we're being shown. Like imagine if Drake were in class and all of a sudden he had a fantasy and the fantasy was about something like that paper going away. He could actually wake up and go, wait, this is a moment when I should talk. Like for me, when I have a pathologus occur and I'm aware that it's going on, I always ask myself, what happened right before it? And usually what happened right before it is the antithesis of what's happening in the drama. And it was a doorway. I had a choice. I could continue in a path that I don't know, that is undetermined, that I have no idea where it's going to go. I have no idea how to function even. Or I can choose in what I know from the past. Mm -hmm. And so the pathologo scenes to me, when I'm aware of them, are in fact wake-me-ups. Yeah. Only yeah. if I've understood them. If not, then I've got to play them out and have a talk about yeah. it. But if I've understood them, I can be like, oh, this is that theme again from this scene. Oh, it's telling me to do something. So you can actually look for the logos behind the pathologos. And I think that's kind of... Uh, ultimately, you can tell the difference in your states of mind. One state of mind is closed, sure. it's determined. Sure. And the other one, even though it's scary, is open and undetermined, and, but also filled with states of wonder and joy yeah. <laughs> and beauty. Yeah. So I would think that our understanding of, of midwifery allows us to take his model and like, Complete it. No. Fill it in more. No. You know, like how, again, I never understand what it means to participate of intellect or 
<laughs> you know, like. Mm. By the way, page 35 is the section on... Okay, would you read it, please, or...? Well, it's only... Um, <clears throat> I am only prepared to go 10 pages. I didn't know if we were going to read, read, or talk, talk, like... <laughs> but if Socrates asserted that he knew nothing, and the Pythian oracle pronounced him to be on this account the wisest of all men, as he himself informs us, consider the profound meaning both of the Pythian deity and of Socrates, and how by the assertion of knowing nothing, this is implied that the good alone possesses an exempt transcendency. But not he who possesses scientific knowledge, and this it is to know that he does not know. Now, he goes on, but... Uh, uh, is that all he says about it? <laughs> for it is indeed necessary that he should perfectly know that he does not know. See the way he takes it? Perfectly It's indeed know. necessary that he should perfectly know that he does not know. Okay. It's the other way around. It's rather that what he knows is so clear to him uh -huh. and so wondrous uh -huh. that he would never mistake it for anything else. And therefore, he must have knowledge of what the self is yeah. at that same time, yeah. With, yeah. what real knowledge of the yeah. self is, right? Yeah. yeah, this is what... So therefore, when one of these pathologos images pops up, like, a pathologus is always a conclusion. It always fulfills for us the meaning of something. Yeah. And rather than looking directly and staying in a wonder state of, oh, no, I don't really know that, we grasp on to images and we grasp on to feelings. And all of those are actually the world of the body. So if we continue to allow Platonic philosophy to sound like it's just talking about the intellect versus the body, then we are actually in some ancient discussion, <laughs> completely separate from practice of philosophy, and it makes it academic, like it's a good paper. Yeah. But hey, now you could write uh -huh. a paper uh -huh. on how, how you can understand the idea of providence and fate uh -huh. and respect to midwifery. Well, uh, I think you've done a sufficient amount of work on that, sir. <laughs> <laughs> Here I'm trying to get him to do some work. He's passing it off. He can add his own. I think the only thing that I would add is like, how do we actually explain that it's the realm of the body, and that's it's like the just, world of appearances. You have a model here. It's just you're pointing out. Yeah, it lacks this element. You could put it in. It totally does. Like, because how do we, other than to say like, and you know, the earthquake came and it knocked my house down. Therefore, I'm at the whim of fate. Like, so what happens the rest of the day when like nature's not <laughs> guiding me? You know, like. And how, do, how does fate actually play out in, the, in my life in that sense? Mm -hmm. You know, like... But, but earlier, <coughs> earlier when you were talking about um, how a daydream wakes you up to something mm -hmm. that you should have done or yeah. points out or gives you a kind of a kick in the butt. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I was thinking that that's... Mm -hmm. Um, how providence works through pathologos, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, yeah. Like that's because um, I had the question at the, earlier was how does um, do pathologos fit into providence? Or in what way can fate be providential? Uh huh. And that was that was an answer that I got. Yeah. Even in the dreams, we see it brings us back to connections that we need to look at again, at least in that sense. I think that is, in one sense, the beginner's level of it. Like, if you're more active, you see, you know the symbols. We've studied how many, we all have seen our past scenes how many times, you know? And sure, there are things that we haven't seen about them, so that's still to be explored. Like, if you can't wake up from your pathologos by reverse seeing, then you still have something to look at. But if you can, then you're out. Like it came to you, it's a language, like it's a, 
It's its own way of understanding. The pres- Pierre always says to us, you can't have pathologos unless you're approaching success. So, what do we normally do when we have a pathologos? Ah, oh, shit. <laughs> man, I'm a man, I'm in a problem. Ah. Rather than be like, wait a minute, this could only be here because I was actually approaching something good, something really good. So what, so what was that? And if you can, normally, so this is another th- side of things, normally you actually have a real question. Like that's your boundary of your mind right there. That's your boundary of your understanding. Mm-hmm. And rather than like sit in that space and just not know, and, and <laughs> yeah, be uncomfortable <laughs> not knowing, we come in with like a, like a back door or a, if we are in this state, what happens, you know, a conclusion that we've already taken up from that. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So sometimes I use it as like a, a way of helping me to see what it is. Like I didn't even know the significance of some scenes. Mm-hmm. I'm unaware until a pathologos happens and then I become aware of the significance mm-hmm. after the pathologos. Mm-hmm. Right. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Like, I'm acting up. I'm a, I must be doing something right. <laughs> yeah, right? And so it is always particular and the only way you get that understanding is by actually going through the midwifery to find out what those themes mean and where they come from and how they're parallels to the present. So... I would want to write a work of like how to use the pathologos to guide your, <laughs> to guide your understanding. But, so you're doing it. Yeah. Like that to me because we're supposed to be using it to, as a tool to learn about ourselves. Like there, sure. there could be no problem of the self versus the true, an image of the self unless it, its presence were good for us. Mm-hmm. You know? And... We talked about this a couple of weeks ago. I asked, what is the providence of a pathologos? And ultimately, a pathologos is something that's like a tool that the mind uses to wake us up. Mm-hmm. And it tells us that we were missing something. We can continue to go down the route of the conclusions and the psychological aspect of it in terms of like freeing ourselves of those images. Or we can actually have fun playing with it. Sure. You know? so that is the issue, like... Uh, why is it that we feel miserable and we experience suffering because of something that happens? <laughs> why, why is that, how is that possible if the world is guided only by fate? Okay. Why would we feel misery? Because it would just be happening. Yeah, I mean, it's yeah, just, just a happening. How come, why are we unnecessarily going through suffering? Yeah. It's because of suffering that is showing that there's something weak about this fate-driven <laughs> world that we're taught. We wouldn't is, even care. Is the real, that's right. Yeah, we wouldn't even care, right? Yeah. We Why are we just... getting upset about this and that? Uh-huh. It shouldn't be. Right. So even again, if we were to study all of the Parmenides and master the Parmenides and master every text of Plato, we would actually not be able to live a platonic life. Sure, that's right. And, the, and nobody has actually in four, nobody has ever come up with that, that bridge, except for him. And why is that we wouldn't be able to? Well, I mean, just tell me what it means to participate in the realm of forms. Forms? Yeah, how do you participate in a form? That's easy. You know? The word form is a mistake. Or, yeah, or an idea, no, you know, no, like... No. This whole idea of the doctrine of forms comes out of one translation. Oh, yeah. That's a Jowett translation, Jowett. which was the only translation available until, uh, well, uh, it was the most dominant and popular translation other than the Loeb. Mm-hmm. And therefore, it was also cheaper. No, you can and so that's where people come up with this idea, has he translated ideas, yeah, forms? because or? if you went for the lobe in those days, it would cost you 250 to 3 bucks first. <laughs> there was tons of Jowett going around. So versus $10 for everything in Jowett. Uh-huh. All of The all whole of thing, it, right? 750 $10 is all it needed. Well, my, so, my thought is about that is like, 
I, or how does what does it mean to participate like, to jump from hypothesis to hypothesis? Okay, just go back. Uh-huh. The word is idea. Idea. Uh-huh. There is no such thing as form. That's a translation of the word idea. Uh-huh. I see that. Yeah, so therefore, okay, so, so now ask the question again without the word. Well, form. how do you participate in idea or idea? Like I don't like. Okay. What does it, mel- what does it no. mean to rise above the world of becoming? No, no. You have to ask, what are the objects of ideas in the Greek world? Okay. And those are? Beauty, justice, uh-huh. idea of, the idea of good. Mm-hmm. But those are the so-called ideas. So even then? But those are only... Those are inherent in the experience of the brilliant light of being. Right. They're inherent in it. Uh huh. So were these people just walking around having this experience all the time differently than like we are? Like it was just so natural to them that they knew what they were talking about. Like when when somebody says, uh, "Oh, I want to," f-, like the way that. Even in the Phaedo, it sounds. It's like we have the body and we're trapped by the body and we can't see truth because we have the body with us and we need to get out of the world of becoming to see the world of being purely. Right? Like that's what they present in the Phaedo. Yeah, yeah. Now you have to understand what they mean by the word being. Uh huh. See, the word being refers to the same thing as the luminous light of being, mm-hmm. it's the same thing as beauty itself. It's the same thing as mind itself. These are all synonyms Mm -hmm. for the same thing. They're different aspects of looking at that one experience. Right. So I I appreciate that. But if we if we were trying to say like, hey, Platonic philosophy is about getting out of the world of becoming and getting into being itself, that's like an empty statement to me. That sounds do it again. What's the empty statement? Platonic philosophy is about getting out of the world of becoming and freeing oneself to enter the world of being. Of course, because we, our culture doesn't teach us what the word being means. Or becoming? Well, the word of becoming is the world of change, simply. Uh-huh. I'm, I'm saying, like, without midwifery, I wouldn't even know how to identify what that stuff means in Plato. It's, too, it's like too abstract. Like. Yeah. Yeah, I agree with you. Whereas when you say like an image of my mother or father appearing powerful and strong, and I can see how it's just something that appears and comes and goes, and then I become like that when I take mm-hmm. on that belief, mm-hmm. I can actually like see that mm-hmm. happening in my experience. And when I become liberated from those images, and I experience states of mind that are luminous, open, now I can actually understand what being is. That's right. Only then. Only then. Not right. from like... Uh, oh, wait a minute. Only then. Okay. And <laughs> Before that, it's just intellectual rubbish. Yes. Yeah, it's just like... Uh, it's like college. It's, yeah. it's like you sit a bar around, like, lots of great theory and, you know, intellectual... I mean, look, Proclus is one of the most amazing minds I've ever read, other than Plato. I mean, the guy can take an idea and fold it inside and out and turn it uh, like forward and backwards. But without actually having, again, a practical background in midwifery, I don't think it would make any sense at all. Like there needs to be a connection to how we discuss logos and pathologos and belief and image. Because other than that, like even the, as wonderful as the divided line is, what is it other than an intellectual exercise? I mean, <laughs> unto itself, it's... And does anybody, like, look, in Plato, there's how many paragraphs? There's one paragraph on gaining self-knowledge through dreams. That's right. And the guy wrote how many dialogues and never decided to write another damn paragraph? <laughs> That's right. <laughs> About dreams? That's right. Even though he singles it as, as the, mo- the only way. <laughs> and nobody explains that? Well... Or the allegory gave, no, 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 nobody explains how to take somebody through the freeing them of an image and getting them to look at a belief. I mean, sure, we do have Socrates doing that about, like, what is knowledge or 
excellence. But even again, I bet Mino went home, you know, and Theotinus went home and went, oh my God, that was a great talk. It went right back to their fundamental beliefs because they never found why they came to them or... You're right. You know, like... Yeah. Yeah. So, I think it'd be best if, like, uh, somehow we were able to express that because then it makes the the platonic it makes platonic philosophy real yeah like engaged by the way sense. have you related this to Proclus's study of the dialectical treatment of providence the one that we read from the commentary on the Parmenides yes no I haven't okay you need that okay because how what will it guide me to think about or what does that mean it, it takes all of this and puts it in 24 categories with one sentence for each. Oh, yeah. Therefore... Got the truths of providence yeah. right there. Great. And he takes it through the four, cate four categories. So, therefore, he's talking about what it is itself, right. its effect on others, mm -hmm and then the effect it has on themselves and the effect it has back on its source and in each one of those categories he wants to make three points that were repeated throughout mm -hmm. and it's therefore, amazing yeah it's very concise and it's very brilliant yeah he's an, he's an incredible thinker his, yeah. and especially all of his work on providence after this you know he does the on the ten doubts of provi against providence, or on the subsistence of evil, and man, he's just the guy was a, yeah. a machine, and we yeah. don't even have all of his works. Imagine if we had them. Yeah. So good, good. So if you're interested, I suggest reading it. Uh, there's a lot of fun sections in it, especially on the different types of knowledge, uh, and then especially on like the soul's power as being elective. Yeah elective and that's because it's it's clear that we don't have the power of providence or we would free ourselves we would free ourselves that we require something else to like and a participation in that we also are not of the body because we do have choice or we we aren't just moved by others we in fact can move ourselves and other things at the same time so he gets into a cool section about how the soul's power is that of choice and what makes it to choose one way or another and so it's a pretty fun section, but so okay. had some fun. Thank you guys. Okay. Yeah. Thank, yeah, you. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank yeah. you. He's so kind to. Wait a minute. I know, right? I mean, I would have written back and said, "Let me know if you have a question." What's this? Oh, the the section, page three sixty five. Yeah, I'll write it down. The whole thing is on front of your Oh, thank you very much. much. Thank you. Very gracious. Very gracious. Very gracious of Proclus to outline very clearly what Theodore's position is. Oh, yeah. Yeah, very oh, yeah. charming. He's the head of the school, right? And he's right. Wow, I would mind from your right. teacher or from somebody who is a good friend. I mean, he sees himself as a friend. Yeah. From the leader of the Tong school, <laughs> giving uh, you a lesson. I mean, yeah. Can you write me a letter? <laughs> oh, yeah, probably, like is it? Not my position. Yeah. Probably to mine. Addressed it to the head of the Platonic Academy. <laughs> Whoever it was, right? Yeah. And broken the right back to your friend. Yeah. <laughs> So do, we get the hand of, so do we get to hand the pen to somebody else next week? Should we hand the pen to somebody else next week? Sure, if you like. <laughs> I made the mistake of choosing what we would read. I and, thought uh, it was nice. No, oh, it's nice. Oh, yeah. Yeah. You, Opened up some good discussion. Yeah. Yeah. Oh. You, linked, you linked it into what Mid brought you into the game. Yeah. And, and to be honest. Providence. Oh, totally. Yeah. <laughs> And logos. Before and logos. I ever before logos I ever met Pierre, that's my first spiritual experience. I was midwifed, 
and I was aware of it as I was having it. I was like, my mind's bringing me images to think about things. And then I met you, and I was like, holy shit, this guy's talking about the experience I had. Like, I gotta learn this. <laughs> Thank you. Yes. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, he is uh, providential. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's mm -hmm. nice. But you'll get this. Great. Each one of them, they're all numbered 24. Mm -hmm. So that's the numbering, and she makes points from the Greek. Oh, so sweet. I'll get it back to you. Thank you. And you can pass it this way, too. And you can pass it this way, too. Well, I thought you passed it around, didn't you? I didn't buy it. Probably put that on one in the lab. Thank you. You want a copy? Is it the hair of Pleasant? No, it's not. There are the categories of purple, the street, and the dialectic, and the common area of the analogy. Yeah, I want it. Okay. I think next time, Pierre, I no. wouldn't even present the book. I would just present my own ideas, <laughs> to be honest. No. Or I'd take a couple quotes and play from that. You know? Hey, it's fun. It's fun. It's fun. He did open it up. Okay, so what do you say? We help put, put it away? What? Yeah. Got you interested in reading it? Yeah, really. Yeah. Oh, it's a fun one. Yeah. <laughs>